MZ TV. Here's a basic question that has a basic, lovely answer that I am going to give you today here on MZ TV. And the question is, does God need to reconstruct the human body at resurrection? Somebody asked me this question recently. I know I've answered this before, but again, I have uh, a lot of new subscribers. And in fact, I have got in the last see uh 12 years i've gotten one sub new subscriber every day every day in the last 12 years it's amazing you might say oh martin you're not exactly setting the world on fire I'm not trying to set the world on fire that's god's job my job is to supply the body of christ with good solid scriptural spiritual information that's going to give you peace and this topic gives me an opportunity to talk about resurrection, which is one of my favorite topics. Now, those of you in the body of Christ who, to whom I am speaking, uh, we don't have to worry about resurrection because I heartily believe that we are of the generation that will not see death because, as Paul says, we shall not all die. So don't let anybody tell you that everybody in the body of Christ has to die. Yes, that's the actual teaching of Clyde Pilkington. Everybody in the body, every member of the body of Christ has to die. Startling, shocking, appalling, but yes, that's what the man teaches. So I have to continually uh, expose that teaching because it's in direct contradiction to Paul saying we shall not all die. But of course, Clyde's argument is, well, that belongs to the old body of Christ. We're in the new body of Christ. All these man-made borders and distinctions, throw them all out because there's a beautiful, simple truth. And I'm, in a be I'm into, big time, beautiful, simple truths. A simple truth is not to say that a truth is unspiritual. It just means that we can believe the word of God and we can believe that all of Paul's letters are for us not going to talk about that particular topic going to talk about the topic i just announced but before i do i'm going to share a video with you made by our friend stephen janowski on the topic of the pre-existence of christ i know we've hashed this out um, to extreme degrees and i'm satisfied that i've set forth the truth uh, this is not a controversy, by the way. The pre-existence of Christ versus the non-pre-existence of Christ, it's not a controversy. This is the truth versus a sect. And in the video below where Stephen, who calls himself Gerardo King, Gerudo King, I'm not sure. It's a pretty, uh, pretty elegant, uh, like, mysterious title. I love it. I don't understand where it's from, but I'm probably aging myself. It's probably some cool hip thing. I don't know what it is, but anyway, he makes a beautiful argument in here. I mean, all the arguments are great, but this one really stood out to me. And that is that those of us who are, who proclaim the pre-existence of Christ. It's so wonderful to just point to scripture verses and say, well, God says this, God says this, 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 and this. And I'm not going to go over the verses again. This is not the topic of this show. But there's one way you can tell the truth versus a lie that belongs to a sect. And that is that those holding to the truth can point to scripture verses and say, well, there's the verse. There's the verse. John, all the, the verses, the verses in John chapter one, Colossians chapter one. We, I've been, we've been through all of them. Philippians chapter two, we've been through all of them. What should prick your ears up and convince you that something is not true is that if you can't point to a scripture verse, but rather you have to explain a scripture verse, 
you have to, in the case of Aaron Welch, you have to write thousands of words to explain why the scripture verse is not saying what it is clearly saying. That's a big clue. And that's how simple this is. When he said that, we can point to scripture verses. Boom, that's it. If you can't point to a scripture verse, if your argument depends on asking questions that are fueled by uh, human reasoning, like, well, why would God, like many people ask on the second death, well, why would God raise people from the dead and judge them only to send them to the second death? You see, that's human reasoning. What I always say is that because that's what God says he does. Or Paul deals with this very issue in Romans 9. Why would God judge people that he makes hard? Paul's answer basically is because that's what God said he does. Well, how do we know that Jesus Christ was actually the source of all creation because that's who God said he is. Well, how do we know that when Paul says that Christ emptied himself and took the form of humanity, how do we know that that was actually Christ? Because God says it is. I love it. The beautiful simplicity. Oh, it's a gorgeous thing. And it is always on the side of truth tellers. This assumes, of course, that you're using a good translation of scripture. Someone could argue and say, well, Martin, you have, we have to explain all those verses that use the word eternal, like these shall go, on the way, go away into everlasting punishment, yet these into everlasting life. You know, you spent a lot of words uh, explaining that passage only because of the bad translation. This is Matthew 25, 46. If you have a good translation, you don't need to explain. These shall go into Aeonian punishment, and these to Aeonian life. A Aeonian chastisement, sorry, not punishment. Aeonian chastisement. Chastisement is different, different than punishment. Chastisement is corrective, whereas punishment is punitive, meant only to satisfy the vindictive nature of the punisher. So when you have a good Assuming we're working from a good translation, we just point to the verse that says, because God said, there it is, God said, don't need to spend a hundred thousand words explaining how God didn't really mean that, how Paul didn't really mean that. Don't need to spend a hundred thousand words explaining why half of Paul's letters aren't for us. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. And by the way, this is uh, a corollary uh, truth. You want to know how to tell a conspiracy theory from, from the truth? Here's how you tell. And that's another simple thing, a beautiful test. It works every time. If your theory requires thousands of people, even a dozen people, if your theory requires a dozen people to not speak about it, to shut up and to keep the great secret, then it's a conspiracy theory. That's a dozen people, let alone thousands of people. So if a, cons it's, if a stated theory, if people, it doesn't matter if they call it the conspiracy theory or not, but if whatever theory we're dealing with, and I'm not gonna give any specific theory here, you can pretty much guess them yourselves. If it requires thousands of people to keep the secret, it's false because it's hard for one person to keep a secret, let alone thousands of people. So there's that. Now, concerning the human body, does God need to reconstruct the actual elements of a dead body? And this is a concern. Somebody was concerned about whether a body is interred or entombed or burned. That is, Cremated. And one would think that, well, God would have a hard time 
bringing back a uh, cremated body. And people go to such passages, passages as Lazarus, where Lazarus, his, his same body, the same body Lazarus went into the tomb with, he came out with. And one has to assume that it looked like Lazarus. It was Lazarus. The same with our Lord Jesus Christ. His body was not acquainted with decay, but Lazarus's body was acquainted with decay. And if more time had gone by, his body would have, it would have not have looked good when he came out of the tomb. Okay, it would have come out looking like a zombie from a zombie movie. Now, concerning those 500 who came from the tombs after our Lord raised from the dead, Scripture doesn't say how long some of them had been in the tomb. But I'm assuming that in that situation, these people were recognized as they walked through Jerusalem. Hey, that's Harry! That's Harry! He died five years ago. And Harry, it looks like Harry. He's just as hairy as Harry. So, God certainly can reconstruct the human body and burning the body or disintegrating it in a number of ways, uh, including cremation. People have had their ashes strewn across mountains, ocean, desert. Uh, one person I heard who was a Frisbee fan, he wanted his ashes made into a frisbee or put into the plastic of a frisbee and he wanted his friends to throw the frisbee and so they would be they would be wafting him aloft um even as he uh, reposed so can god reconstruct the elements of course because there's nothing that's lost no element is lost it just takes a different form when a solid takes the form of a liquid and then becomes a gas or any of the elements of the original substance or substances uh, lost? No, they're just reconstituted, but they exist somewhere. So you could take a cremated person whose ashes were scattered at sea, for instance, and God can reconstruct every single element wherever those elements went. But I am here to tell you today on MZTV that God doesn't need to do that. It's a handy thing to be able to do. In the case of Lazarus, in the case of our Lord, it's like, there's Lazarus, there's our Lord. And this begs the question too, does the body we will have in resurrection, let's assume that some of us, well, some of us have had friends. I've had friends who have gone the way of the grave. It ticks me off. I don't like it. Don't like it at all. Nelson Howe, Nelson Cardwell, Charlie, Cronk, Gene, Douglas, our brother James Corum. Um, when these people raise from the dead, the dead shall rise first at the snatching away. Yes, they will be rising first. Whether Nelson Cardwell or Nelson Howe or James Corum, whether they still look like they did in life, we will recognize them. This is another question I often get. Will we recognize our loved ones? Of course we will. Whether it's a case of we'll recognize them because they look like they did when we last saw them, which is entirely possible. God can do that. Or that they will have some new, advanced, high-tech spiritual body. And a spiritual body doesn't mean a non-physical body. Because again, the opposite of spiritual is soulish. It's not ethereal. So a physical, a, a spiritual thing can certainly be physical. The example I always give is that the implements of the temple service were spiritual implements the fire pans and the breastplate of the priests all the garments they were holy the curtains the curtain rings the rods the everything used to construct for instance the ark of the covenant the cherubim the poles the coffer itself those were all spiritual and yet they were as physical as can be so God does not need... Oh, so to finish that thought, 
even if our loved ones have completely new bodies, it will be then a matter of spiritual cognizance. It will be a matter of a heightened spiritual sensitivity that will allow us to recognize our loved ones, even though they're in a completely different body. For instance, our Lord appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus as a light brighter than the noonday sun. And Paul asks, you know, who are you? So it's not like, it's not like when Jesus showed up on the road to Emmaus with the travelers that day. That was the day of his resurrection, remarkably. Jesus can do tricks with his new body. So he can appear as a human body, but apparently the body he took was not recognized by those disciples. Could be that they never met him in real life. I'm not sure. So it might be that he looked like the Jesus Christ that went into the tomb, or it could be that he altered his appearance as he is able to do. But when he came into the upper room uh, with the disciples, he looked like he did when he left, which would be convenient but not necessary because we will have a heightened spiritual perception and we will be able, be able to recognize our loved ones even if they don't look like our loved ones. Now, let me use a computer analogy. The information of our lives, who we are as people, all of our experiences, I will compared to a hard drive on a computer. The hard drive has all the information of a person's life. And in the computer analogy, let's just stick with the computer analogy for now. The hard drive has everything on the computer. So it doesn't matter what kind of casing you put the hard drive in. You can put it in a phone, you can put it in a supercomputer, you can put it in all sorts of multifangled casings that we would call computers, but it wouldn't matter. Put it in a green computer, a red computer, a tall computer, a skinny computer, a squat computer, a tiny one, a big one. It doesn't matter. It's the information on the hard drive. And neither does it matter what kind of monitor you use. A monitor just shows you what's on the hard drive. So you have three parts of a computer. The casing, that is the actual construction of the computer itself, the hard drive, which is where all the information is, and the monitor, which shows you what's on the hard drive. And the analogy here with uh, death and resurrection would be the body, the soul, and the spirit. The casing of the computer would be the body. The monitor, that is what shows what you experience, that would be the soul. Soul is our perceptions, our senses, analogous to the monitor. The monitor is analogous to the soul. And the hard drive of the computer is the spirit. The spirit. But here's an important consideration. For human beings, there is no consciousness in the spirit alone. No consciousness. When God created Adam, he blew the breath of life, that is the spirit, into the casing, into that inert being that he had created out of the soil. And Adam became a living soul. His monitor came on. He began to experience things. So spirit connected with a body and the result was a soul. The soul is not a separate part of humanity. The soul is what results from the spirit joining with a body and at death of course the whole process is reversed god removes the spirit the body returns to the soil and the soul just disappears and the word hades in the greek and sheol in the hebrew just means unseen where does it go uh, when you unplug your monitor where did the image go when you turn off a light where did the light go it's unseen it just disappears it's not a thing in itself it's the result of body and spirit or in the case of the light bulb the electricity would be analogous to the spirit and the bulb itself and the tungsten filament would be analogous to the to the body and it's and the light and the heat would be analogous to the soul so the question is and i don't know the answer to this does every person have their own individual spirit? It could be. 
But again, I need to emphasize that this, there's no consciousness in the spirit. So when God removes a spirit, let's say, let's, let's put it this way. When God, if God removes your spirit at that, God removes your spirit. Is that your spirit? Is that piece of animating life particularly yours? And does God have like a file cabinets where everybody's spirit is? The person's not there. The person is where the body is. And even if the body has been scattered, the person is scattered. The person doesn't exist. The person doesn't exist anymore. Your Uncle Harry does not exist anymore. But God has the spirit. God has the information. Now, it doesn't have to be that this is Harry's spirit. Now, see, I'm a little uncertain as to whether this is the way I used to think of it is that spirit is spirit is spirit. It's just this vat and God just takes spirit. It's not anybody's individual spirit. He just throws spirit down and a body becomes a living soul. And when the spirit goes away, then the spirit goes back to the vat of spirit. It's not anybody's individual spirit, but God still somehow has the information. But I don't know whether the spirit contains the information, you see. I don't know whether it, the, the information of our lives, who we are, our experience, our experiences can be tied to spirit. I don't see, there's only one verse that suggests that. And it's, uh, I forget which account it is. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll find it. I'll put the reference down here, of course. Jesus raises a girl from the dead. And it says concerning her, and her spirit returned to her. Her spirit returned to her. Hmm, interesting, her spirit. Is that a figure of speech? It was said to be her spirit in that passage. But it could just be that since spirit, that is, God pulled from the vat of spirit, was reunited with her body, then it's a figure of association. The her spirit will be a figure of association for the spirit coming back to her body. Or it could literally be her spirit. So it's either that the hard drive, the information about a person's life is in the spirit. And that that person has their own spirit and God keeps them in index boxes. See, I, I don't, that's, a, a, that's appealing to me. I like that. Just don't know if it's true. So I can't tell you that it's true. But it doesn't matter because whether God has an, whether people have an individual spirit or whether God just takes from the vat of spirit and puts spirit into that person, and God knows who that person is, irrespective of their body, then that person comes back to life. That person. The question is where's the information? Where is the information about? that person's life it's not in the body because God again just the, the computer analogy the information is not in the casing of the computer the information is not there you can use any casing like I said you can raise any body it doesn't matter what it looks like any kind of body as long as you have the, the, the information of that person put it in that body and it will be that person and again, with a computer, any monitor will do. And so the person wakes up in their soul. It's not their soul. It's just they become a living soul once again. But God has the information. That's the important thing. God, it's easier to think of it as a person's individual spirit. But God has the information. And he does not need to reconstruct the same human body. He can put it in any body. He can rebuild the body from scratch. He can. He can rebuild the body from scratch and take the spirit. Let's assume that the, that the person has their own individual spirit. Take that person's spirit. It's easier to think of it this way and put it in that body. And boom, it's that person. Different body. But it's that, it's that a person. Or, again, God just has the information somewhere else within him takes from that vat of spirit and puts that information back into the spirit, reunites that spirit with a body, anybody, could be the body that the person went into the grave with, as is the case of Lazarus or our Lord, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. God is on it. 
that's the comforting thing I will leave you with is that God knows exactly. Remember, I read Psalm 139 on, on Friday. God knows exactly who we are. He knows our comings and our goings. He knew us in our mother's womb. And, and so he knew us before we existed. He knew us. And, and so he has all the information. Where it is, I don't know. But God's big enough to hold it. And he's good enough. And he's loving enough to bring it back.